is, yeah, it just means that that is your perception of that person. And that is a big difference. How we perceive someone and what they actually are like internally is often very different, right? I, we see somebody and another person sees the same person and they see a very different person. So very often people may in fact have a good qualities. So when we say that someone doesn't have any good quality, it's just our perception of that person which uh, I is like that. In, in reality, it may be quite different. Uh, and uh, that, that is a very important point, because it means that you don't judge people strongly. You realize that right now, it's hard for me to see good qualities in them. Uh, but maybe down the track, yeah, you open up the possibility that they may change, or things may actually turn around. Uh, and this is a very uh, D good reminder of the impermanence of human beings, how we're always moving around in samsara, moving from one level to another one, uh, moving from being a difficult person to an easy person, from a kind one to an angry one, uh, and we're all moving around like that. And you are allowing other people to develop by saying, I'm not going to fix you too much as a bad person. If you consider someone a bad person straight away, it's a problem. Much better to think of them as a uh, fluctuating uh, phenomenon, yeah, always fluctuating. Uh, you are a fluctuating phenomenon. You can say that to someone, see what they say. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> but the people are fluctuating phenomena, yeah, always changing, uh, and uh, never to have any s as, uh, too strong views about it. And it's beautiful because other people, if you, they feel very harshly judged, uh, then very often they get stuck in that judgment, and it's hard for them to get out of it. Uh, by uh, giving people that flexibility, you're actually giving them a sense of kindness, an escape route yeah, from that problem. Uh, and uh, that is a very compassionate thing to do as well. Uh. So please, uh, that's uh, just a sub-point of what I was talking about yesterday. Never judge anyone too harshly. Uh. Just understand the limits of your own perceptions in this practice. So now let's look at the last kind of person. Uh, and this is the, uh, the really nice person. Uh. And uh, the, uh, this is on page 57, if you are lost in the pages, page 57 uh, in the little booklet. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like, number five. And how, friends, uh, should resentment be removed towards the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are pure, and who from time to time gains an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind? Uh, Suppose there were a pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean with smooth banks, and a delightful place shaded by various trees. Then a man might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. Having plunged into the pond, he would bathe and drink, and then, after coming out, he would sit or lie down in the shade of a tree right there. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are pure, and from time to time he gains an opening of the mind, placidity of mind, on that occasion one should attend to his pure bodily behavior, to his pure verbal behavior, and to the opening of mind, the placidity of mind he gains from time to time. In this way, resentment towards that person should be removed. Friends, by means of a person who inspires confidence in every way, the mind gains confidence. So this is the last person, it's like the saint, yeah? it's like the super duper person uh, who has all good qualities, good bodily behavior, good verbal behavior, and what a blessing it is to be around people like that. You feel really relaxed when you are <laughs> around such people. Uh, and also, they have this placidity of the mind. In other words, they have a mind without defilements. Yeah, and you can feel that in people when they have a very calm and peaceful and serene and kind presence. It's almost as if you can read the mental state uh, when you're there. Uh, and this is part of what the metta meditation is about. Yeah, it's about imagining those beautiful qualities inside of beings. Uh, remember, metta is really about being able to see the goodness in other people, remember the goodness in the world. Uh, and I don't know what, what you feel when you do it. I don't know if you feel, sometimes people don't feel all that much, uh, but part of the, some peop, many people do, but some don't. And, uh, but the point is more to learn, to develop that side of things, uh, yeah, to remember that these qualities actually do exist. Uh, for example, in a person like this, yeah, there are all these serene qualities there. 
and to remember what that means, how it expresses itself, how it feels, uh, and then uh, rejoice that there is a world which actually has beings like that in it. Uh, and we also have the capability of developing these same qualities. Uh, they are potential expressions of ourselves. We may eventually get there one day ourselves, and probably you already have some of those qualities already. Just a matter of developing them further. Uh, so this is uh, this idea of the placidity of mind, yeah? these pure uh, minds and hearts inside of certain people. Uh, and uh, these are the sort of things that make the life really, really worthwhile. And it's important to be able to see that. Uh. But in this case, uh, the problem here, of course, is that here someone is getting angry with such a person. Yeah? And this, of course, happens in the world. You get angry with people, upset with people. They may challenge you a little bit too much. They may say things that you know, don't sound right to you, whatever. And then probably some of you may have got upset by some of the things I have said during this retreat. Uh, probably. You don't have to tell me. I don't really... <laughs> it doesn't, mat doesn't matter. Because that's just life. Yeah? When we talk a lot, we say things that upset people. It's unavoidable sometimes. And it doesn't mean that it's coming from a bad place or anything, it's just the nature of talking, because it's impossible to always agree about everything. We see the world in different ways, and that always leads to some degree of clashes. And that's why the idea of giving people the benefit of doubt and having compassion for each other is so important, yeah? because uh, we know it is unavoidable to have clashes in the world. So here you have this um, beautiful person, yeah? and this is why the simile here is such a Uplifting simile, there's a pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean. No, there's no algae, you will notice, there's no water plants, yeah? There's nothing that needs to be swept aside. All there is is this beautiful pond, beautiful, clear qualities. Not only that, but it has smooth banks and a delightful place shaded by various trees. So even hanging around this pond, even being in the presence of it, is nice, let alone the pond itself. And yet, despite that fact, someone arrives afflicted and oppressed by the heat. Yeah, they are, have ill will. This is what heat means in this simile. They are oppressed by this ill will. And for that reason, they are weary and they are thirsty and they need something to quench that ill will, get out of it. They are parched like they are drying up or something. And of course, the answer to the, your Ill will then is to remind yourself that this person actually has all of these qualities. And that reminder is like plunging into the pond, yeah? drinking up those good qualities, uh, taking those good qualities into your heart, reminding yourself of those good qualities, building them up uh, as a perception inside of yourself. In this way, it's like you're drinking them up. Uh, and of course, when you do that, all the ill will must disappear because you can't see all those, those good qualities uh, and still have ill will because there are two opposite ways of looking at the world. Uh. So that is what it is about. It's easy when someone has so many good qualities, but uh, you know what it's like. Uh, sometimes we do get upset with people uh, who are really pure. Uh, I don't know, I lived with Ajahn Brahm for 25 years and I know that I sometimes I get upset with Ajahn Brahm. It's just unavoidable. Yeah, how, can, how can you not do that? Uh, and at the time of the Buddha, sometimes people would get upset with the Buddha and they would literally go and shout at the Buddha. Imagine that, imagine that. How can you go and shout at the Buddha? It's like, you know, it almost makes your hair stand on and even thinking about that. Uh, but that happened at that time. Uh, there was a famous Brahmin, this is in the, from the Sangyutta, like he was called Akosaka Bharadvaja, and Akosaka means abusive. So he was, his name was Bharadvaja, the abusive. <laughs> it's a bit unfortunate name, isn't it? Uh, that was his name. And it's just like, you know, you have the, uh, the king, the ancient kings, they all had nicknames like, you know, Carl the Great and all these kind of things. Uh, but this was Bharadvaja, the abusive. It is, it's a bit different. Actually, there was a King I read about recently, uh, his, what was his, he had a strange kind of epithet, it was a Scottish king, I think, uh, and he was, what is we called again? He was called uh, uh, King John the Dull or something like that, <laughs> I can't remember. So there were some kings, even some kings who had weird epithets, even, even in, uh, at least in Europe, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in Europe at least. Uh, so Akosaka Bharadvaja, the famous sutta with him, is where he goes to the Buddha and shouts at the Buddha. Uh, and the Buddha just sits there impassively, yeah, looks at him and thinks he's crazy, of course, because that's what he is. When you get really angry, you are a bit crazy. 
And uh, then uh, there's that famous simile that he gives that I, I mentioned here, I think probably last year as well. There's a nice simile where the Buddha says, well, Akkosaka uh, Bharadvaja, when you invite guests to your house, uh, and uh, the guests don't eat all the food, there's food left over after the party, uh, who does that food belong to? Uh? Oh, it belongs to me, says Bhara. Yes, in the same way, all this abuse that you are throwing at me, it belongs to you, says the Buddha. Uh, yeah, it doesn't affect me at all. For the Buddha, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, but you will be affected by all this abuse. And he thinks, hmm, maybe you have a point. <laughs> maybe there's a point to this. And somehow I think he turns around and he becomes a, I can't remember whether he becomes a monk or not, but probably that's often what happens in these stories. So, so the idea here is to develop a sense of care yeah, for people, really see them for what they are, see all of the good qualities in them. In this case, it is very easy. And then they have the rest of the simile, which is very interesting here, is that uh, after coming out, uh, he would sit down, lie down in the shade of a tree right there. Yeah, it is so pleasant to be around such people. Uh, it is so relaxing. Uh, you feel so good uh, being around such people uh, uh, that you just want to become their disciples. Uh, Yes, yeah, so you look at the Buddha, you look at some of these great saints, uh, and you think, wow, how can I be so stupid? Uh, and then you go from being angry to becoming a disciple instead. Uh, and you lie down, you hang out with them, because hanging out with them feels nice. Uh, I always found it very fascinating when I go and visit people like Ajahn Ganna, or people find the same with Ajahn Brahm. Especially when you get, you, you have to get a little bit used to them first of all, because initially you're maybe a little bit afraid. Yeah, I'm gonna, I can read my mind, I, am, am I ready for that? Not sure if I'm ready for that. <laughs> so you're a bit worried in the beginning, but after a while, when you really start to relax around them, you can't be afraid of anything. If you want to read my mind, I'm gonna, please read my mind, read all the rubbish, I don't care. I know you will be kind to me anyway. You have no doubt about the compassion. If you sit there thinking that you want to kill Ajangana, he will still have compassion for you. Yeah? So it doesn't matter what you think. Yeah? That's the nice thing about it. Yeah? So, uh, and then after a while you get used to them. Uh, I see all the people, yeah? mostly lay people, they just sit around him. They don't, they, they don't hardly talk. Yeah? He throws them a few sweets you know, and he says something which is not all that necessarily interesting. Yeah? Sometimes a bit, actually usually his speech is quite, quite good. Huh? And uh, they just sit there, it's like they are bathing in the glory of Ajahn Ganha, bathing in the metta, bathing in the peace, uh, and just feeling relaxed, yeah. It's a feeling that very often they can't, cannot maybe find in their work or at home. Uh, and that is what a good monastery should be like. It should be a refuge for people uh, where you can chill out, or a good Buddha society like the BGF. Uh, you can come and relax and be in good company here uh, and feel different from what you ordinarily feel in your life. That is the idea. Yeah, one of the ideas of the refuge of a good monastery here. Uh. And um, uh, there's some interesting stories. I, you know, like uh, take Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm, one day he was walking around, as many years ago apparently, there was a man sitting in the car park of the monastery. He was just sitting in his car. So Ajahn Brahm goes up to him and kind of to find out what's going on. Are you okay? Are you, you know, not having a heart attack or anything like that? Uh, no, no, it is not at all. I just, uh, every, he just said that every day when I feel a bit stressed out in my job down in the council, the council is only 10 minutes drive away, Every day when I feel stressed out, I just come into the monastery, park my car here, sit in the peace of a monastery for a while, then I go back to work again when I feel better. Uh, and as an ordinary Australian person, uh, not even a Buddhist, uh, yeah, just come in to the atmosphere and just to be able to relax and be at ease and feel uh, a kind of atmosphere of acceptance yeah, and kindness and care so you can actually, life becomes better as a consequence. And this is the idea of being, part of the idea of being in the presence of someone like that. Uh, of course, that's only the beginning, uh, yeah? that's only the start, then comes the practice, then comes all the things you have to do. Uh, but it's a good start because it shows you that there's something there which is really worthwhile. That is really kind of the critical thing that turns you around, uh, gives you confidence and faith and it gets you going on the path. Uh, there's something powerful going on uh, and uh, you need to get in touch with that somehow. If you have a heart which is very closed, uh, you're not really able to relate to other people very well, you're not really able to feel atmospheres and these kind of things, uh, it's much more difficult to be inspired in this way. But if you have a more open kind of mindset, uh, 
then these sort of things may, may happen as a consequence. So, so you become a disciple. And uh, that's why then it says here at the very end that uh, um, it is by means of a person who inspires confidence in every way that the mind gains confidence. And when you see the arahants in the world, when you see the stream enters, uh, when you see those who have practiced a long way on the path, that is where the confidence arises from. Uh, this is one of the important things. That combined with the word of the Buddha is a very powerful combination. Uh, seeing the reality, seeing the result of the suttas, uh, and then seeing the place where that comes from. Uh, seeing the sutta, the teaching that actually makes that possible. Uh, the result plus the path coming together like that is a very powerful thing to uh, give you confidence in what is happening here. So, um, the, uh, it's interesting little word, uh, Samantha Pasadika is found in there. And the, uh, this is the, one, the only place in the suttas where the word Samantha Pasadika occurs. Uh, and that then becomes the, actually commentary, becomes the name of the Vinaya commentary later on. So I think, uh, Venerable Buddha Gosa has taken the name from here and then added it to the Vinaya commentary. This is what has happened here. Her. So I'm not sure if that is very interesting to you, but I thought I might mention it anyway, just uh, in passing here. So uh, these friends are the five ways of removing resentment uh, by means of which a bhikkhu can entirely remove resentment towards whomever it has arisen. Uh, so what do you think? Are you ready now to remove resentment towards to whomever it has arisen? Huh? Are you clear? Are you? Huh? Is it going to work? Yeah. 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 Gradually, huh? not straight away, right? Important to remember that these things are not kind of magic bullets that bang, it's all gone. Huh? It's a slow working pill over time. Yeah, it kind of works. But uh, these are the sort of things, if you really want to be committed to spiritual practice, this is the kind of thing that you have to do. Yeah? This is where the work really lies. Uh, of course, anyone who keeps the five precepts, anyone who tries to live a life of kindness is already doing a lot of good in the world. And you can be very happy with yourself if you live a life like that. Uh, but if you want to add even more, if you want to go even further, uh, and if you want to ensure that your meditation gets a good boost, this is the sort of stuff that really empowers the meditation. Because what you're doing here uh, is you're actually not only are you overcoming ill will, but you're also developing metta at the same time. Uh, you will notice how the sutta chain moves from uh, looking, uh, looking aside all the bad qualities and moving your mind to the good qualities. Uh, so you're not just avoiding the ill will, you're actually developing metta at the same time. Uh, so there's a big process happening here as you're doing this. Uh, all of these things come together. It's not as if you just come to a flat mind which doesn't have any emotions. No, you're also building up the good emotions at the same time. Uh, so this is very, uh, very useful if you are truly want to commit yourself to these teachings. And many of you are very committed because you you know, we, I see you coming to Perth and meditating for long periods of time and all kind of stuff. I mean, it's very... So uh, these are the additional kind of things that uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and it's not that hard to do. It's just a matter of commitment. Uh, yeah, the principles are not that hard. Uh, do you understand, ever understand the principles behind this? Yeah, it's not that, you know, super duper. It's not kind of, you don't need to be an intellectual superstar or have a PhD in mathematics to understand what's going on here. You can sort of get it without that. Fortunately, otherwise there wouldn't be many arahants in the world. Uh, okay. <coughs> so now I want to take it a little bit further in the same direction. I'm going to look at another sutta, which I very often read out on retreats, uh, uh, the Kosambia Sutta, and this is more rela related to developing metta directly here, and how this is done. Uh, and uh, this sutta uh, is part of uh, an incident that happened at a place called Kosambi. Kosambi is uh, on the southern side of the Ganges River. It's higher up in the Ganges than uh, uh, than uh, Pataliputra, uh, yeah, the Patna in, in the present day is higher up, it's close to the, I don't know how well you know northern India, probably not that well, but there's two large rivers in this area, one is called the Yamuna, and one of the other one is the Ganga, the Ganges, uh, and roughly where they meet, uh, that is where uh, Kosambi is. Uh, I don't know if that is very helpful for you, but anyway, I thought I 
let you know. Huh? <laughs> you've been there, yeah. Okay. Wow, you've been to Kosambi. I've never been to Kosambi. That's uh, okay. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe I have to keep up with the ayahs. Huh? Not, <laughs> not with it. <laughs> See, I don't know what's the name, yeah. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's right, yeah, okay, I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, what's the name again? <laughs> um, this is the Magand part of the Magandhya story, yeah? Magandhya was the queen who, who, uh, who was, yeah, right. I think, okay, I oh really, okay, yeah, yeah, so anyway, there was also a good, a big monastery there at the time of the Buddha called Gosita's Park, and uh, so this ha probably happened around that monastery, and this is when there was a big argument in the Sangha, this is a very famous quarrel, uh, when the Sangha was getting split, uh, yeah, and the Buddha couldn't do anything, it was very interesting, yeah. The Sangha was arguing about some very trivial matter. I think the matter was something, someone had left some water in a pitcher in the toilet. Yeah? And after you have used the toilet, you use water to clean yourself, uh, but then are you supposed to pour out the water? And someone hadn't poured out the water. And then the question was, had they committed an offense? Or had they not committed an offense? That was apparently the story behind that. And then there was well, this massive argument in the Sangha, and the Sangha was split. Yeah? And the Buddha tried to calm them down and say, "Listen, what's the, you know all of this stuff? Calm down, have compassion, be friendly with each other." And then the monks reply, "Oh, Master, you just relax and and kind of be at ease. We will deal with <laughs> we will deal with this issue." Yeah, very rude to the Buddha in a sense, but very likely these kind of things happened. Yeah, because when you get really heated and really angry, and large number of people get together, you become irrational in this way. And this is the story behind these things. And then later on the Buddha comes out, uh, and after a while, that's also the story when he goes to the Paralayaka forest, yeah, he leaves the Sangha, he goes into the forest, and then in this Paralayaka forest there's an elephant that looks after him. Uh, there's a many Paralayaka versions. In one version there's also a monkey that looks after him. It depends which version you read, whether there's only an elephant or an elephant and a monkey, but uh, various, various things. A very famous story anyway. And then later on the Buddha goes back to the Sangha and then he gives this teaching. Yeah? This is a teaching about how to have harmony, how to live together. Yeah? So very useful uh, in that sense, given to the Sangha, but all applicable to everyone, of course. Yeah? So this is how it goes. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Uh, because there are these six principles uh, of cordiality, in other words, like being friendly or courteous to each other, that creates love and respect uh, and conduce to cohesion, to non-dispute, uh, to harmony and to unity. Uh, what are the six? So this is what, if you want to have harmony, yeah, these are the harmony creating um, qualities. Uh, um, saraniya dhamma, saraniya means yeah, cordiality perhaps, piya, love or dearness, garu, respect, sangaha, like coming together, yeah? I don't know, cohesion sounds to me like a very cold word, but the idea of coming together and, and creating a community, if you like, yeah? avivada, yeah, that means like non-dispute, samagya is um, harmony, yeah? samaki in Pali, in, in Thai, Samaki, okay. Eki bhava means uh, being one, being united, uh, unity here. Yeah. So what are these six? And uh, not surprisingly, metta is one of the main themes of this particular sutta. So here, a bhikkhu maintains bodily acts of metta, of loving kindness, both in public and in private towards his companions in the holy life. This is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect uh, and conduces to um, uh, community, uh, to non-dispute, uh, to harmony and to unity. Uh. 
So the first one is always to start with the basics, yeah, loving kindness in body. Uh, it means that we kind of we support each other, we try to act to each other with ways that are friendly and kind. Uh, remember the word loving kindness here, metta, is derived from mitta. Mitta means friend, yeah, so metta literally means something like friendliness. Uh, loving kindness, love is a very ambiguous word in English, it means so many different things, so I'm not... <coughs> Not necessarily, not necessarily always the best translation, uh, but loving kindness, it's friendliness is a very good way of thinking about it. Uh. And uh, so you are friendly uh, by body, yeah, and uh, you are both in public and private. Uh. And this is, uh, of course, a very important point that uh, when we have metta, it is not just a show, it is not an external thing that we're trying to kind of engra engra ingratiate ourselves with others or we're trying to be publicly kind of looking good or we are trying to uh, you know fit in or whatever else it is which of course all of these are very human things to do and sometimes we do that and it's okay but the point here is to have integrity yeah to always have these qualities uh, not for as a show not as an external thing but as a deep entrenched quality of our character that is always expressed whether you are outside or you are inside, you are uh, sitting in your cave or you are in a public, uh, you are the same kind of person everywhere. It is called integrity in English. The English word integrity is quite good, uh, in that you are the same in all situations. You don't try to kind of, uh, you know, be something different just because you're around certain people or whatever. Uh, treat everybody roughly the same as well. Uh. So this is an important point, otherwise it becomes hollow, it becomes like a show, and then of course it doesn't really have any real resonance. These are qualities of your heart uh, you're trying to develop. Uh, um, and uh, interesting here that it says you have this towards your companions in the holy life. Of course, this makes sense when you know the context, because the Buddha is speaking to the monks who are arguing with each other, uh, but uh, there's also something true about this, the fact that the people often we need to focus the most on with metta are the people who are closest to us, uh, because they are often the most difficult ones to have metta towards. Uh, yeah, like family members, after a while, we, it's not that we are very angry with them, but they become kind of so used to them, uh, yeah? They are around us all the time, and uh, because of that they often get on our nerves, because they do the same mistake for them. I told you a million times not to do that. Uh, I told you, what well, is that old thing? I told you a million times not to exaggerate. <laughs> no, that old saying. <laughs> but, uh, so, and this is the problem. So that is often where the hardest work is uh, with the people who are closest to us. Uh, and for the monks, that will be other monks. Yeah, they bec after a while they become not exactly like family, but you know, you, you see them a lot, every day almost. Uh, so that is where you really have to put in that uh, extra effort. Uh. And if you're able to have metta towards the people who are closest to you, yeah, then it is much easier to have metta towards other people, because they are more distant. Uh. It's more easy to give them the benefit of the doubt, perhaps, and these kind of things. Uh, yeah? So uh, when you come together, when you meet people more rarely, it is not so hard. Uh. Because you don't, you don't know them that well. If you really knew me, you probably would think very differently about me, right? Uh, it's because you only see me once a year. Uh, yeah? <laughs> so I'm very lucky not to, to only be here once a year, otherwise it might be very different. But it's always like that. If I came here every day, after a while, it would be very different. Uh, that's just the nature of things. Uh. So, um, uh, you have companions in your holy life, the people who are closest to you, and then you expand it out from there, yeah? You, you bring it out into the whole world. Uh, and uh, then this is this principle of cordiality that creates all of these good qualities. Uh, and uh, creates love and also respect. Uh, it creates unity and concord. All of these things are so important uh, for a community to work and to be effective and for uh, the spiritual path to progress. If you're part of a community where there is disharmony and there is, not, uh, there is problems and disunity or whatever, it is very hard to practice the Buddhist path in that kind of community. So very useful to have this sense of unity and harmony together here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is the first one. So see what you can do. And there's surprisingly how many opportunities there are in the day of 
for doing little acts of kindness, yeah? And look out for those. Uh, don't think that you are above certain acts. Yeah, sometimes just do things that are kind of below kind of what you think might be your status. Someone told me the other day that, you know, even though it wasn't really his job to wash the dishes, he said, okay, I, sh I sort of took, took part and washed up because it wasn't my job. And that is precisely why he said it felt so good because I was doing something that wasn't my job. So sometimes when you go outside, what is your area of expertise, you do something different. Then actually it leads to some extra goodness. Yeah. So if you have a you know, so uh, and that is kind of nice way of thinking here, yeah? and uh, because it adds that extra uh, dimension to kindness there when you think like that, uh, and uh, don't think that anything is outside. Do things that are very, you know, uh, unusual, like Ajahn Brahm, you know, holding up a door for one of the junior monks. That's a typical thing Ajahn Brahm would do, yeah. <laughs> and he says he just loves that because it's kind of just kindness in action, uh, yeah. And you are, you, you do these things in that way. You don't have any hierarchy. Ajahn Brahm could probably travel around with, you know, big limousines uh, if he wanted to, most places he goes, but sometimes he just likes to go tra public transport, uh, yeah, simple. Uh, and then just look at the people, you know, <laughs> and see what the world is like, yeah, and just keep things low key yeah, and do things, do ordinary things. Work in the monastery, Ajahn Brahm hammering in a few nails, just being one of the boys, one of the, one of the monks uh, in the monastery, not taking himself too seriously. Yeah. This is one of those great things in life, not to take yourself too seriously. If you take yourself too seriously, then you think that there are things that are beneath you, too low for you to do. But it just becomes a blockage uh, from being kind, and that is uh, of sometimes a problem. Uh, there shouldn't be those blockages. Hierarchies create these kind of blockages. Uh, so hierarchies are often breaks on kindness. Uh, so we need, sometimes it's good to break down some of those hierarchies that we have, not to be too hierarchical. I come from a society which is very flat, very non-hierarchical. Norwegian society, everyone is on first name basis, yeah? In no way you can speak to the Prime Minister, and if you speak to the Prime Minister, you can use his first name, and it would be okay here. Can you do that here in, uh, in Malaysia? Probably not, yeah? You probably think you're very, very rude if you did it in Malaysia, yeah? Because in, in Norway it's so flat, yeah? So it's a very different feeling to that society here. And, uh, and sometimes that is beneficial. I'm not saying it is always beneficial, but sometimes it is, especially in these kind of situations. Okay. Um, the second one. Again, a bhikkhu maintains verbal acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to, cohesion, to um, community, to non-dispute, to harmony and to unity. You have verbal acts. Again, private and public, yeah. you, you, are, you are kind of, you speak in one way and your focus is on your companions in the holy life. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, the idea of speech is, ve speech is a very powerful thing. Uh, we can do so much hurtful with our speech, but we can also do things that are so, go to people's hearts if we speak in the right way. Speech is a very powerful tool. Uh, it can be very stabbing or it can be very, very soothing, depending on how we use it. Uh, and remember, it is not just other people who affect you, but you affect people in exactly the same way. Uh, so there is this possibility, yeah, you always have the possibility uh, of giving other people the gift of kind speech. Uh, it's a very powerful gift. Uh, and you're really um, expanding the possibility of giving gifts this way. Suddenly this enormous possibility of giving gifts, uh, every time you open your mouth, is an opportunity to either uh, destroy someone's happiness, uh, or to improve someone's happiness, or to be more neutral. A lot of the time it will be more neutral, because we just need to get things done. Uh, but even then, if you can do it with kindness, uh, you are doing something very positive. Uh, it's good for the other people, they feel happy, you are building up your own metta and kindness inside, it is good for both. And this is one of those definitions I like about a spiritual practice. Any practice that is good both for you and the other person is by definition a spiritual practice. Yeah? 
both you and the other person. If you think about it, generosity is good for you and the other person. Kind speech is good for you and the other person, etc., etc. Meta meditation is good for you and the other person. Everything on the spiritual path has this duality. It's good for everyone. Huh? Whereas a worldly act, which is not spiritual, often tends to be selfish. Yeah, it's about me, 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 my house, my car. Don't touch it. Stay away. And um, this me thing, yeah, which is kind of the worldly way of thinking. Or you can kind of give up yourself for someone else, and you, you know, you. That also is not really right. You shouldn't give up your own happiness for someone else. Then you have also gone too far. Yeah, so it is that balance, middle way, where you are doing what is good for everyone uh, at the same time. That is a real spiritual or Buddhist act of speech or mind or whatever. Okay, next one. Again, a bhikkhu maintains mental acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, uh, towards his companions in the holy life. This too is a principle of cordiality, etc. So mental acts of loving kindness, yeah, you tend to have this uh, positive mind state, you see the good qualities uh, in the good people around you, uh, and you maintain that, you try to avoid succumbing to all of these negative mind states. Uh, and this is something that goes on continuously. This here is not a reference to meditation practice, this is a reference to what you do in your daily life, yeah. Uh, and ideally, if you are able to do this even a little bit in your daily life, wow, you're going to go a long way. And this is in a large part exactly what we were talking about in the previous sutta, that ability to shift your attention away from the ill will and anger towards the positive mental state. Yeah, now you know, have some idea how to do that. Uh, and uh, if you persist and persevere, you will be able to, to do this. Again, both in private and in public, yeah? yeah? And again, starting with the people who are closest to you, companions in the holy life, etc. That's where you start out. Uh. So this, once you have getting all of these things into place, uh, you have the metta by body, speech and mind, then metta meditation really starts to be possible. Yeah? Because at this point, you don't really have any enemies anymore. If you can do this, enemies are gone. Not only that, but you have a large surplus of positive feelings for the people around you already. Uh, and all of that will enable you to understand what metta is uh, as a felt feeling. And then you will be able to do that in your meditation practice. Uh, so this is really the foundation. Uh, one of the interesting things when you read, there is a sutta, which I have read out on these retreats before, uh, the Kakachupama Sutta, the simile of the So, Majjhimadikaya 21. It's a very beautiful sutta, you may want to have a look at it if you have a chance. And in the simile of the So, the Buddha says that when you develop metta, the first person to focus on is the person you're having trouble with. Yeah, so if you have trouble with somebody, somebody's treating you badly, that is where you start your meditation. It's almost the exact opposite to what the Visuddhimagga says. And the reason is because the assumption is that, that you don't have any enemies. Yeah? You don't have any enemies or you are already friendly with everyone. So as soon as the problem arises, you make sure that that problem is dealt with first. So if there's one person you're finding difficult in the moment, you deal with them. Okay, they are treating me badly, but actually it's not a problem. I can deal with that. It is their problem. They need compassion. They don't know what they're doing, etc., etc. And then you deal with that problem in that way. And then when you overcome that ill will towards that one person, uh, then it's as if the barriers to metta have been dismantled. Because even if you're negative about one person, there is a barrier here that stops you from developing this universal feeling to everyone. Uh, so dismantling the barrier first, uh, then you can actually uh, spread the metta to the whole world. Uh. And uh, so, in a sense, it is interesting that the method used in the Visuddhimagga seems to be different from the way it is, it is in the suttas. Uh. And there is many explanations for that. One explanation is that the Visuddhimakka method is more basic. It's an earlier method. Uh, and that the Sutta method is one that is useful for one who has already developed their mind to a very high extent. Uh, yeah? That is one way. Uh. But uh, it is also possible that the Sutta method is just generally more better to follow. Yeah? Because um, 
simply because it is the word of the Buddha, and the Visuddhimagga is obviously not the word of the Buddha, and uh, for that reason it might be preferable. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, do whatever works, uh, and if it works for you, then uh, carry on and, uh, and see where it takes you. Okay, so that, that is the metta part of that sutta. And uh, now, uh, let me, let's also briefly have a look at the last three of these uh, uh, principles of cordiality, because they are also quite nice. Again, a bhikkhu uses things in common with his virtuous companions in the holy life, uh, without making reservations. Uh, he shares with them any gain of a kind that accords with the Dhamma, and has been obtained in a way that accords with the Dhamma, including even the mere contents of his bowl. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect, etc., and conduces to unity here. Yeah, so this is the idea of generosity, here, of the idea of sharing with others without holding back. Let's see what the Pali is here. Apati, apati. Vibhatta bogi So um, this means, yeah, I, think, I think it means something not holding, not holding the back. In other words, having an open heart, yeah, always willing to share um, even the contents of your bowl, uh, whatever has been righteously obtained. And this is one of those things that you see in the suttas a lot as well, is that when you are generous, uh, it is much better that you have received your gains in an honest way here uh, yeah because when you have worked hard for something you have spent your kind of you have really done something then when you give it feels like a real act of renunciation and generosity because this really feels like you have earned it properly but if you are a thief and you steal something and then you give it away it's not going to have the same effect uh, yeah because it doesn't really feel like it belonged to you in the first place. Uh, you hadn't really worked hard for it. It is not the same kind of act of renunciation. Uh. So if you put a lot of work into something and then you give it up, uh, yeah, that is a really powerful act of generosity and renunciation. Uh. And that is why it is so powerful very often. Uh. So uh, <coughs> this is again one of those principles here. It has been righteously obtained. Yeah. A monk has received these arms in a good way, not in a dodgy way, and then it is a much p more powerful gift as a consequence. Uh, so uh, you try to share whenever you have the opportunity. Again, the importance of creating harmony and community by uh, sharing, by generosity. Here. A lot of the things that you see here are in parallel to what is called the four... Uh, the four... Uh, um, what's it called again? The, um, uh, the basi basis for creating uh, harmony, san Sangaha Vatu, are they called? <laughs> sangaha Vatu. So the Sangaha means to uh, pull together, yeah, it's like creating community. So these are the basis for creating community. These are very similar. Here you have generosity, yeah, then you have kindness and speech, is also mentioned here. Beneficial actions are also mentioned here. The only one missing really is treating everyone equal. That is the fourth one of those four, Sanghavatus. Anyway, let's have a look at the last two. Again, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, uh, possessing in common with his companions of the holy life those virtues that are unbroken, untorn, unblotched, unmottled, liberating, commended by the wise, not misapprehended, and conducive to stillness. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect, etc., and conduces to unity. So here, uh, what this means is that you're practicing virtue consistently. Yeah, This is the idea here, with all of these words that really mean pretty much the same thing. Yeah? I, the, um, the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi, I, I don't know if I really unblotched, unmottled, there's a kind of unusual word, you don't usually hear these in daily speech so much. Uh, I think it's because he has, he's a little bit too educated, the good Bhikkhu Bodhi. <laughs> So here, uh, but basically, these are all about precepts that are kept 
properly, yeah, kept to the highest possible levels. So they're not blotched. I think it means that they're not really contaminated or something like that. That's the idea here. Uh, uh, mottled means they don't have any specks on them, yeah. So they are kind of pure, purely kept, uh, kept consistently and to a very high level. This is the idea here of this. Uh, yeah. So the more consistent you are in your virtues, uh, uh, in your practice of good and ba good good actions uh, the more powerful they're going to be here and then you have this idea that they are liberating yeah this is one of those very important points uh, if you are virtuous you feel liberated uh, and this is uh, again this is it's kind of strange how many people in the world think that being virtuous is like a confinement. They think it's like being in prison. Because once you have to follow rules of virtue, you are constrained in what you can do. And they think that that constraint is a kind of prison sentence. I don't want to be constrained, I want to do whatever. And, but that is a very shallow idea of liberty. Yeah, it's a very superficial idea. Okay, I can do what I want, but what does it do to your mind? If it affects your mind in a bad way, if it in if it imprisons you in guilt and regret and remorse and you feel bad about yourself, that is a much worse prison. The thing that we are really trying to liberate here is the mind, yeah? It's the kind of feeling good about ourselves and being helpful to the world. That is what matters. That is the liberty that matters. The liberty that means that we can mess around and enjoy ourselves in bad ways and do stupid things. It's such a superficial liberty. I don't even know why people are interested in that. The deep liberty is the liberty of the heart, the liberty of the mind. That is what matters in the world. And I'm sure you would all agree with that, because otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. Because uh, that is the real freedom, the inner freedom, freedom from the inner tyranny. That is the one. The external tyranny, you will never be freed of anyway. Okay, you can be freed a little bit here, a little bit there, by making a better society or whatever, but it's only very marginal. It is the inner tyranny which is the problem. And the inner tyranny is the defilements of the mind. Uh, and if you can free yourself from that, that is where real liberation lies. Uh, and that is what really matters. Uh. So this is what these virtues do. You are following rules, you're trying to be kind, but actually you are liberating yourself in the process. And this is kind of the uh, astonishing thing about this. Uh, commended by the wise, in other words, praised, praised by the wise. Yeah? So the wise say, uh, the wise kind of think about you in a good way. Uh, it's kind of nice, it's better to be praised by the wise than to be praised by the uh, mafia or something like that. If the mafia praises you, it's probably a bad idea. Uh, or the triad said, yeah, you're a really good triad member. If you're a good triad member, it means you are probably a, not such a good spiritual person. Uh. Do, are there triads in Malaysia as well? Uh, yeah. Have you got, yes? Okay. Every, okay. <laughs> <coughs> How do you know? <laughs> well, you know? It's just the general knowledge, I presume. Uh. Okay, it says everywhere, everywhere in the world has this kind of organized crime. It seems to be kind of a universal principle of human beings. We organize ourselves to do bad stuff. And then you have the uh, next one here. It's not misapprehended, which is, again, I, I'm not very fan of his translations here, of the good, good Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, even though I, he's a very nice fellow and has done a lot of good work. Sometimes everyone gets it wrong sometimes. It doesn't actually mean not misapprehended. It means literally not held onto, not apprehended. That's what it means. Uh, yeah, Not clung to, not held to, not... Uh, attached to. That's actually what it means. Uh, misapprehended is actually uh, uh, it, it's just misleading. Uh, and the point is, like we said before, that if you really practice these virtues fully, if you are a stream mentor or whatever, it becomes, becomes part of your person, uh, becomes part of who you are. You don't have to hold on to the virtues anymore. Uh, as an ordinary person, yes, we hold on to it until we reach this point. Uh, but once you really get to the point of stream entry, and this here is actually the definition of this here, is actually the stream enterer's way of practicing sila. So it's a very, very high level. Uh, at that point, you don't grasp it anymore because it's a natural expression of your personality to act in this particular way. Uh, so it's actually not apprehended. Prior to that, you have to apprehend a little bit. Yeah, you have to hold on a little bit. Otherwise, it's not going to work, as we mentioned before. And the last one again. Guess what? It's conducive to stillness. 
Yeah, everywhere in the suttas. What is the purpose of virtue to make meditation possible? Here you see it again. It's just absolutely everywhere. Once you start to see the suttas in this way, and you start to read them carefully here, you can see these themes recur in, in different ways, in different places. And here it is again. I don't know if you would have noticed it if I hadn't pointed it out, that actually this is exactly the same thing that we have been seeing before, virtue being the basis for the whole process of meditation. This is exactly the same thing again. Yeah. So looked at from different angles, uh, from different viewpoints, you can see how these same ideas come back and back and back in the suttas. Uh, and this means that they are fundamental, otherwise they wouldn't be everywhere. It's intertwined and everything is the very fabric of the suttas. Uh, it is not some kind of idea that has been added later on, because it's too deeply embedded into the very word of the Buddha. You cannot really extract it without destroying the whole thing. Uh, this is how important it is. and this is how you understand what actually is important there or not. Uh, so not, notice these small little things, yeah? They really actually make a, make a difference in how you appreciate what really matter, the important points of the Dhamma in this way here. So that is the idea of being virtuous, yeah? When we are virtuous, again, we create unity because we are living together in a <coughs> positive way. And then comes the last one. The sixth aspect of um, cordiality. A bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, uh, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life that view which is noble and liberating. Yeah? He says emancipating here, but uh, I, I prefer the word liberating. Emancipating is like what you do with the slaves. You allow the slaves to go, they are emancipated and leads one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction or complete ending of suffering. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to community, to non-dispute, to harmony and to unity. Yeah, when, when you have common views, you tend to, <coughs> there's less argument and problems, so if you, two people are stream enterers, they won't have any arguments about the reality of uh, life you know, or the world, because they will know exactly what is going on. Huh? And that's why it is very nice to live in a community when people have roughly similar views. Uh, if the views are too diverse, then uh, it ends up being hard to live in harmony in quite the same way. So this is how you get this very harmonious community, by uh, pointing your views in the right direction. Huh? And uh, so this is the Aryan view. So again, we're talking about stream entry. That is why that view is noble. That is why it is liberating, because eventually, if you keep on practicing in accordance with that view, eventually you reach Nibbana, the end of suffering. Uh, destruction of suffering. Destruction sounds very violent, but end there is probably a better translation of that word than destruction. Uh. So it goes all the way to the end of uh, suffering, the view of the stream entry here. So it is nice, I, and I noticed that in a, a community, you know, like we live in Bodhinyana Monastery, basically because everyone there is a disciple of Ajahn Brahm, and you go to the nuns monastery, they're also pretty much disciples of Ajahn Brahm. Uh, there's a lot of harmony, yeah, you live together, it's not so hard to uh, agree on things. We don't have kind of super duper heated discussions about Dhamma, anything like that. Uh, we may discuss certain points just to understand them, uh, but we don't really, uh, the deep things we tend to agree on because everyone is there for Ajahn Brahm, being an Ajahn Brahm disciple. Uh, but when I came to Bodhinyana Monastery in the beginning, it was quite different. Uh, Ajahn Brahm had recently become the abbot, uh, yeah, taken over from someone else, uh, and some of the monks who were there had very divergent views about Dhamma, and it was a much less harmonious community for that reason. Uh, but over time it has kind of consolidated around one teacher and one way of doing things, and then the community is uh, surprisingly harmonious. Uh, uh, not perfect, by no means. Uh, there's always, occasionally there will be little arguments and things, but what do you expect? Uh, that's human nature, uh, yeah? Some people are more argumentative than others, uh, and uh, <laughs> it's always like that, that some people are more problematic. Uh, and uh, it is just the way things are, because you view things differently, and you have to work together. When you have to work together, these things will come out. But generally speaking, very nice. And that is a very beautiful thing, yeah. 
So then, last line, these are the six principles of cordiality, etc., that leads to this unity and thing. And this is what the Kusambhya Sutta is all about. But uh, you will notice that the basic thing there is this idea of kindness, yeah, metta, friendliness, uh, and you can uh, add that, of course, virtue here and generosity are really just expressions of that same, same metta. So you can say that virtue, the factor four and five, really are included in the first three ones. Uh, so this is what this is all about. This is the development that you want to uh, do here, and this is uh, how, you, yeah, how you pursue that. Uh, so again, uh, very practical, I hope. Uh, yeah? It is very quite simple to see how you put this into da your daily practice. Uh, yeah? You si take every opportunity that you see. Uh, don't put yourself in harm's way. Don't allow people to take advantage of you. Of course, uh, be wise about it. Uh, but when you have the possibility to be kind, please be kind uh, to anyone, anyone in your life, your co-workers, your family members, uh, your or even strangers that you meet, yeah, sometimes you can say something kind to a stranger, perhaps if you, f if you feel like it. Uh, I don't know if, that, if that's done here in Malaysia, but uh, some, you know, you, you see these random possibilities. Sometimes I walk with the street and I, with Ajahn Brahm in the morning, and Ajahn Brahm would say good morning to the kind of random strangers on the street, yeah, and they kind of, oh, okay, good morning. <laughs> it's unusual, yeah, it's not so common in the world for this to happen. Uh, and sometimes you brighten up people's day by doing simple little things like that. Yeah. Anyway, let's have another break and see you back again at 10.30. <laughs>